I spend a lot of my time throughout a given year, I, I read a lot of books. Uh, I don't even know how many pages I read in a given month, but a lot. Uh, and so I try to read a, a variety of books from leadership books. I'm constantly reading leadership books, secular and and sacred leadership books. Uh, I read a lot of books uh, on theology about different issues, uh, but I also read a lot of books on the culture. Uh, I read a lot of non-Christian cultural books uh, that analyze our culture, uh, and, and I also read Christian books about our culture. Uh, and I have to do this as a pastor to know how best to equip myself and equip you to be Christ, salt and light in the culture where he has placed you. I have to understand where the culture's at uh, in, in their mindset. So I, I, if you want to go online tomorrow, you can see some of the books that I have read or am reading. Uh, here's some of the ones that I have read that are some of my favorites um, that help me understand my culture. Um, Jay uh, Bud Zizewski is a philosophy professor at University of Texas in Austin. Uh, there is no greater thinker in my estimation uh, when it comes to apologetics uh, than him. He's excellent. Uh, he used to be an atheist. I think he taught at Yale. Uh, he's now in Texas. Why does everybody go to Texas? What's the deal with Texas? Uh, it's a promised land. <laughs> no, that's a couple of states away going west. New Mexico, Arizona, and? Thank you so much. So anyway, we'll, we'll argue later. Uh, gosh, a church split right during a sermon. Uh, anyway, he's, he wrote a book called True Tolerance as opposed to False Tolerance because our, our, our godless, godless world is taking great virtuous words and giving them connotations they never were meant to have. That book is amazing on how to speak to people who've bought into false tolerance. Um, there's a small book, and that's a big book. There's a smaller book, uh, if you like a quick read, uh, by Kostenberger. Um, it's called Truth Matters. Uh, that's a great book to give to a high school or a college student. Uh, uh, why should you believe in absolute truth in a world that believes in relative truth and the danger of relativistic thinking? This is an amazing book. Um, I've read uh, Colson and Piercy's book, How Shall We uh, Then Live?, uh, in light of Francis Schaeffer's book uh, by a similar title back when I was in college. Um, my favorite book, uh, I think of all time, Unsaid Culture, was written by Robert Bork, Judge Bork, uh, slouching toward Gomorrah. That is probably the, you know, outside my Bible, my most used copy in my library. And I have thousands of books. Uh, like my copy's literally falling apart, food stains, coffee stains. Uh, because I don't just read that book, I study his line of reasoning as he reasons how you how you combat the godless nature of our culture. Uh, and of course, back in the late 80s, a uh, uh, great Jewish scholar, uh, Dr. Alan Bloom, uh, wrote The Closing of the American Mind. That is where we are today. Rhetoric has replaced reason. And how do we get back to reason to get people uh, toward truth? Those are some of the books. There's many, many, many more. I submit to those uh, to you for your consideration. You must understand your culture to speak to said culture. But I also read a lot of websites. So here's a list of the websites I read on a daily basis um, where I just keep track of my culture. Uh, so on, every day I read the following websites. I read The Daily Caller, The Blaze, Town Hall, Front Page, Savage Nation, World Net Daily, Newsmax, The Judge Report, American Spectator, American Thinker, The Federalist, Fox News, Judicial Watch, PJ Media, Real, Real Clear Politics, and The Washington Times. Now, I took speed reading when I was younger, so. Uh, but yeah, I did. But, but, I, but I read those every single day. Why? As I keep track of what's going on in my culture. And those aren't all of them. Those are some of them. There's a few more that I didn't put on there. But I, I go in there, I check them out, and I, I see what's going on. I read the articles that pertain to me. Then I use Evernote database system. I capture those articles. I then give them a tag, a title. I drop them into a file. Because I don't want to just read them and go, oh, that was excellent. Now, I want to read them and find them later to be able to use them in sermonic teaching and education to take saints and help you understand how to speak to the culture. Uh, we must all be about this, because where's the culture going? Well, right off the moral cliff. Now, if you read Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah chapter 5 is like the woe chapter of the Old Testament. So this is where Isaiah the prophet castigates the nation prior to their fall to the Babylonians in, uh, in uh, 586 B.C. Uh, he castigates them for a series of sins. One of their main sins was taking that which is truth, light, and exchanging it, and taking darkness and reversing them, calling darkness light. And he begins his list of woes against the nation. You can read it, and it's a one-to-one -one correspondence between their nation and our nation. This is serious business. If we do not know how to speak to said culture, we cannot call it back to, to the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Uh, Isaiah attempted to do that. He eventually paid for it with his life, but he was courageous with the, with the word of God. Um, 
we must be the same kind of people in the nation in which we live. Uh, Paul understood this because he lived in the Roman Empire. Talk about evil. Talk about godless. Uh, and Paul understands the importance of understanding your culture and speaking to said culture uh, with the gospel and the power of the gospel of Christ. Um, he, he tells us when you read his writings, if you study Romans, uh, that we, as, are, as we're in a descending culture, as all of that kind of reading tells you, uh, you shouldn't be depressed for three reasons. And I know Christians get depressed because they watch the news, they read, they study, and it just kind of just seems disheartening. But you shouldn't be depressed for three reasons. Number one, we know how the story ends, correct? Amen. We do. Because I was doing a wedding in Charlottesville yesterday on a hillside overlooking a pond, um, downhill. It was awesome. It was beautiful. But behind me, the crowds, clouds were coming in for a storm, which is typical of this area, is it not? And uh, clouds were coming in, big cumulus clouds. So behind the podium in the arbor were these massive clouds. And so I just stopped when the bride came down the aisle and I said, you know, this is a wonderful image. Uh, the, every time a bride comes down the aisle, I mean, I've been there with the dad bringing your daughter down to get married. Been there, done that, an emotional thing. But theologically, I said, what is this? But a, a theological statement of one day the, the, the bride of Christ, the church, is given to Christ, the groom, and he comes in clouds of glory. And just like these clouds behind me, this is a worship moment, is it not? So we know Christ returns, and we know righteousness reigns. So be uplifted as you follow the trajectory of the culture. It's not the end of the story. Number two, we as Christians know we have the answers of how to reach out to the culture, because they're in the word of God. And so you have answers for the, the morass that they are in. Uh, and number three, what better time to live in a godless world than now, why? Because you can shine most brightly when you obey the scriptures. This is what Paul talks about when you look at Romans chapter 12. He talks about how uh, Christian living, in light of being justified by faith, uh, changes you radically uh, for the culture in which you live. In fact, if you obey the things that he's going to talk about in verses 9 and following, uh, it will revolutionize your life, it will make you a great witness for Christ, and it will change the church, and it will make us a great light to said community. But it's, but it's all about these these characteristic tra traits that he wants you to work on as Christians. So I'm going to assume none of us here are perfect, correct? How about this side? You reach for, no, you haven't reached perfection. So what is Paul talking about here? Well, he's talking about pursuit of radical righteousness, holiness. Uh, and he said it must permeate all of your life, your sacred life and your secular life. You can't compartmentalize your faith. So you can't be just a really great Christian at church and terrible on Monday at the Pentagon, Correct? or CIA, or wherever God has you. The radical righteousness should, should be permeating throughout your entire life. And that's what Paul's going to talk about here. Before we do that, we want to analyze the structure of his argument in Romans in case you're new. Because we get, remember we lose 20% of our people per year, and some of you are new. And so what in the world is Paul talking about? Well, we started this study in, in the book of Romans probably 10 years ago. <laughs> Just kidding. That's a joke. Um, a long time ago. So what are we talking about? So Paul's talking about in the first 11 chapters, how does a sinner get right with God? How does he get right with God? It's, 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 well, he comes to Christ in faith, and he places his faith in Christ as the Messiah, and he is then justified in God's courtroom uh, as, as being saved. He's declared righteous. He gets the righteousness of Jesus. Justification by faith is what it's about. But in light of all that great theology, Paul stops in chapter 12 and says, in light of your new standing in Jesus, what should that do in your life? Paul's very practical. So in chapter 12, we're still reviewing. I'll get to my sermon in a minute. In chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he tells you, I got some commands for you to follow as, as new Christians. Uh, live a sacrificial life. It's not about you. It's about him. You should sacrifice things in your life to advance the cause of Christ. Uh, don't, don't conform to the world about you. And, and let your mind be transformed uh, by being exposed to God in his ways. And then he's then he's going to circle down to the next level, like in a whirlpool. And he, in verses 3 to 8, he's going to say, if you're truly living this transformed Christian life, it's going to be seen in the gifts that you have. You're going to use your gifts to advance the church of God, your spiritual gifts, your spiritual gifts. Uh, by the way, I would say last week was a ministry Sunday. Uh, we had all the ministry fair out here, and I challenge you to use your spiritual gifts to God's glory. Uh, I know just from one area, the children's department had 28 people sign up uh, to work in the children's department this year. That is awesome. So I commend you if you're one of the 28. I, you followed the scriptures. Because uh, you're saying, I'm going to be transformed. And a lot of you were writing me, telling me, I got to do something. Yeah. You got plugged in. And the pay is awesome. <laughs> when Christ sees you face to face. No greater thing than pouring your life into a child. I kid you not. 
But uh, Paul says, uh, let, let's go down from using our gifts to then what else should I be doing to live this radically transformed life now that I'm saved? Well, in verse 9 and following, he's going to zero in on the attitudinal changes that need to happen. And you all just told me you weren't perfect, correct? So we're going to get into it. One verse today. What does he say? Well, let's read what he has to say here. Uh, chapter 12, verse 9. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to that which is good. It's, we're going to focus on each one of those three, three things. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to that which is good. Uh, what he says, first of all here, is if you live, are living this transformed life as a new saint, and you're growing up in the faith, you're going to be radically righteous when it comes to the concept of love. Love. Like, what kind of love? Well, first of all, before we get into the concept of agape love, I want to talk about the, the kind of the grammatical structure of this passage. Uh, if we could go back to that last verse, I think it had the Greek on it. Okay. So if you, if some of our students, people here are taking Greek at Dallas Seminary, so we have to use it somewhere. So if you, if you, so if you look at this in Greek, uh, what you have, if I can turn my thing on, um, what you have here is, so, uh, so the NAS says, let love be without hypocrisy. The NIV says, let it be sincere. Uh, but, but the Greek down here, if you read this, this is the word agape for love, uh, and this is the word for hypocr hypocrisy. Um, there's no verb. I know you saw this, did you not? Yes. Oh, every day, yeah. We'll talk about lying on another Sunday. But <laughs> So there's no verb. So if you, you have high school, how many have high school students in your house, teenagers? They totally listen, don't they? Yeah. So if you were a Greek family and you really wanted to get the attention of the children, you would speak to them with no verbs. It would sound totally bizarre, wouldn't it? What happened to you? You know, Johnny? Well, mom, she wasn't using verbs, man. It's over for me. You know, kind of like that. Now, if your parents want to get your attention, what do they do? What do they do with your name? Full name. You know, my dad came home as a, as a federal agent with a gun belt, the whole shebang. He came in with the handcuffs and everything. And when my mom met him at the door and said, I need to talk to you about Marty. It's over for me at that point. All he had to do was Martin Albert Baker, come here. It's over for me. It's over. So they use your whole name. The Greek culture, they just leave out the verb. If you leave out the verb, it makes it totally emphatic. When he says, let love be without hypocrisy, there's no verb. Be there. Be. Why? It's totally emphatic that you pay attention to love that it doesn't smack of hypocrisy. Now, if there's no verb there, well, in the next sentence, there is a verb there. So if you go down through the sentence in the Greek text, there's a whole bunch of what we would call participles. What are participles? We study grammar out of church because the grammar's inspired too. So the participles, you know, kind of those ing kind of words. So they're all imperatival in their sense because he's saying these things are not like going to, what was it, Ruby's cafeteria or? What do, what do you go to around here, a cafeteria with a smorgasbord? I don't go personally, but no one goes to a smorgasbord. These are truly godly people. Okay, so you know, you know how a smorgasbord works, right? So you go in, you got your plate, you're sliding along, and they give you this huge plate, and you're thinking, I'm limiting myself to 500 calories per section. And you're sliding along, and you come to stuff that looks like, oh, no way I would eat that, Right? And you're like, mm, that looks good. I was doing this yesterday at a hotel we were at, sliding along, you know, getting my stuff. I'm getting, okay, sausage, great, you know, this, that, eggs, yeah. And then, then they had, it's Charlottesville, they had sausage gravy? Yeah. What is this? I open up the lid and I'm like, oh, unbelievable. I, I couldn't even put it on my plate. So what's I got to do with theology? everything, right? Because you go through a smorgasbord and you are selective, are you not? I ain't touching that. Son, don't lift the lid. That's, that's gravy. It's some kind of southern thing. Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> and my family's from the south. But, but yeah, I just never did the gravy thing. It always freaked me out. But see, some people do their Christian walk like this. Well, you know, I don't know. There's some of the commands that Paul gives. And then I treat my Christianity like a smorgasbord. That one bugs me. So I'm not doing that one. No, you don't have the option. This is not a smorgasbord. These are prescriptions, not descriptions. They're prescriptions for activity as a Christian. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. What kind of love? Agape love. What's agape love like? Um, selfless. No conditions. No strings attached. I mean, it's, it's, it's total love. It's, it's a love that drove Christ from the throne of glory to come to earth and walk the dusty trails up to the Golgotha to die for our sins. That's love. 
That's love, selfless love. Jesus talked a lot about love. In fact, that whole concept of love is a part of his very first sermon in Matthew 5. What did he say? Verse 43. Uh, he's uh, castigating the Jews of the day because the Pharisees, uh, well, they tightened what God loosened and loosened what God tightened. That's what a legalist does. Legalist says, you do things the way that we say you should do them, uh, and then you shall be holy. The only problem is when you get onto the legalistic uh, treadmill, they constantly change the rules and the regulations. What did Jesus say? You've heard that it was said, quote, you shall love your neighbor, and by the way, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he, God, causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. God is not partial. For if you love those who hate you, what reward do you have? Answer, none. He says, don't even the tax collectors do the same? I mean, don't the tax collectors of the day who ripped everybody off? He said, they love each other. He says, if you greet only your brothers, what, are, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Translated, you know, if you only love people who are, well, they went to the school I went to. Or they, we think the same. We read the same kind of books. We like the same kind of movies. We both play golf, blah, blah, blah. It's easy to love that person. It's really hard to love somebody who's, well, they're a Democrat. And I'm a pub Republican. Or I'm a Democrat and they're Republican. I speak from family gatherings. Isn't it interesting? It's like you're not all on the same page. But the question is, if you're a Christian, what are you supposed to do? I'm supposed to love whoever. Whoever. And so somebody that doesn't agree with you, you still love them anyway, right? You still love them anyway. And that's what Jesus says. You love those who are caustic toward you, mock you, may hold an opposite position, but you still love them. That's agape love, total acceptance. Not of sin, but you love them as a person. Notice Jesus in John chapter 13. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you, what? Love one another. Uh, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. Notice it's conditional because you have a free will. If you love one another, if you love one another, agape love, selfless love toward one another. Some churches and some church people have not got the memo on that one. You go there, they're a war zone. They split, they fight, they fight, they split. I mean, there's some of those folks thinks it's a spiritual gift to split a church. Yeah, my gift is uh, I stay there about five years. I create dissension, and then I go to the next church. I mean, I've met these people. I've dealt with these people. What did Jesus say? If you are mine, you get along with each other because you love each other. He says it's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. John 14, 5, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. What's the flip side? If I don't keep his commandments, it's showing that I don't love Christ like I should. John chapter 15, 9, just as the Father has loved me, I've also loved you. Abide in my love. It's something you have to work at. He says, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. Jesus said, I exude love because I'm always obedient to the word of the Trinity regarding truth. Follow my example, Jesus said. His last uh, prayer before he left the disciples, his high priestly prayer, John chapter 17, verse 25, he prayed this. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known you that have sent me, speaking to his disciples, and I have made known your name to them, and I will make it known to them. Why? So that the love which you have loved with me uh, may be in them, and I may be in them. God, I'm, I'm praying that my people, when I leave, will love each other. You know what? The greatest thing we can do as a church is love each other, and they see that love. I had a lady in here one time. I was over here trying to get out with the mass of people trying to get out after the sermon. You know how it goes. I say the sermon's over. <laughs> Everybody's gone, like, instantly. It's unbelievable. I was over here, and I was in a sea of people. It was kind of a choke point right there. And a, a lady I didn't know, so I asked her, you know, who she was and how she got here. And, and she turned around, and she looked back at the, you know, everybody trying to exit. And I said, you know, why'd you wind up here? How'd you wind up here? And she goes, I don't know. She said, the first time I walked into this building, uh, and she was new. She'd only been there a couple times. She said, I, I walked in here, and I was looking at the people. She said, I don't know how to put my finger on it, but I could sense love in this place. So I don't know what you're doing to keep doing that because that one lady picked that up, that this was a church that loved each other. And she said, I'm here because you, you truly do love each other. And she said, I know it's a big church, but I, but I sense the love. Well, I think you've got the memo, but there's always room for improvement, isn't there? Because I know how it works. I don't really like her. Now, I like him, but I don't like her. She's got some attitude issues and control issues. I don't. She does, et cetera. So, you know, you see what I'm saying? But if she's another fellow believer in Christ, I mean, what, is, what did Jesus say? You love each other. Love each other. 
Uh, and so Jesus is all about love. Paul says, hey, let's start at the top. If you want to live a radical life, then do it with great love. Now, what's interesting, he says, do it without what? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? Simple, saying one thing, doing another thing. Now, this is an illustration of hypocrisy. Don't freak out. I'm not preaching with this on. It's just, okay. Okay, what is hypocrisy? It's a face, right? Now, do you know who this is, by the way? Well, I know it's a ninja turtle. Yeah, it's also Michelangelo. Yes. Uh, now, this is one face. Now, why are we talking about this? Well, the Greek word for hypocrite is the Greek word used in theater of a play actor. Oh, someone's playing a game. It's, they're playing a part. So you can imagine in, in a Grecian theater behind the stage, if they had a green room back then, you could imagine a couple of uh, theatrical people having a huge argument with each other. And they're mad and angry, etc. And all of a sudden, they walk out on the stage like this. But behind the mask is what? Anger. I'm going to get them. I'm going to, after this, I'm going to totally destroy them, etc. And so Paul says, if you love as Jesus loved, you'll do it without play acting. What is play acting? Well, it's, it's fake love. It's agape love, but not true agape love. So what's it like? I'll give you four illustrations. Number one, uh, play acting love, hypocritical love. Speaks words of love, but doesn't show works of love. Speaks words of love, doesn't show it. Uh, uh, James talks about this, the Lord's brother, in, in uh, James 2. He says, uh, what, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says that he has faith, but he has no works? Can faith save him? Answer, mm -mm, no. He says, if your brother or sister was out without clothing and in need of food, and one of you at church says to them, oh, go in peace. Be warmed. Be filled. That's my blessing from my family to you. He then says, yet you don't give them what is necessary for their body. What use is it? What use is your statement? None. See, this is a hypocrite saying, oh, I see your need, but I'm not going to do anything to meet your need. I'm just going to say, may Jesus bless you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Did that help him? Why are you so quiet all of a sudden? No. Uh, hypocritical love. Hypocritical love uh, speaks in a loving fashion, acts in a mean fashion. Uh, Judas, remember him? Uh, in John chapter 12, uh, it says, Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume uh, and she anointed the feet of Jesus. She wiped his, hair with her, uh, his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Judas saw this, Iscariot, uh, one of the disciples, who was attending to betray him and said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? I love the poor. You just wasted this, Jesus. Why'd you let that woman do that? It says parenthetically, now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to pilfer it. See, false love. Oh, I love the poor. If you gave me the money from that costly perfume, I would have put it at touching lives for Jesus. Now he was saying, I want the money in the money box so I can skim some of it for myself. See, he's speaking words of love, but he's doing mean things down to betraying Christ with the kiss in the garden, Remember? Saying words of love, is that, is that you? Do you speak words of love, but then you do mean things behind people's backs? Paul says, let love be without hypocrisy. Hypocritical love is seen when you uh, say that you will pray for someone and you never do. Remember, they told you their need and you say, oh, man, you could count on me. I will be on my knees before the throne of God for you. And you never pray for that person. Is that not hypocrisy? It's hypocrisy. Here's what I would suggest how you cure that one. The next time somebody comes with a need and they say they need you to pray for them, put your arm around them and do what? Pray, pray then. So if I'm ever down front here talking to people and I got my arm around them, we're not having a gar gardening discussion. Now that's a really bad weed, spotted spurge. You need this to kill spotted spurge. I'm not having that kind of discussion. If I got my arm around somebody, unless there's distraught over spotted spurge, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's happened. But if I got my arm around them, I'm going to be praying for them because I know that once you hit about 50, you start forgetting what happened on one day and to the next day, correct? And so you're going to tend to forget. So hypocrisy would say, just tell them, be warm and be filled. I'll pray for you later. Now pray now. Uh, hypocritical love is awash with conditions. How's that work? This is how a legalist operates, the truly pious. I've seen him in action a million times. I've seen it in marriage relationships. The husband or the wife can, you know, say, oh, he has hurt me so deeply or she has hurt me so deeply. But if he does X, I'll forgive him. Hmm. Well, your husband just told me that he did X. Did you forgive him? Well, yeah, I did, but there's A, B, C, and D. And if you, 
He does these things, then I'll forgive him. So what's the husband do? He jumps on your treadmill. He does A, B, C, and D. He comes back and tells me, okay, I did him. And what does she say? Oh, no, A, B, C, D, they're E, F, G, <laughs> he keeps going. See, that's a, that's a legal list. You can never please a legal list. There's only one more thing. Hypocrisy. Jesus says, love as I loved. He gave 100% forgiveness. And in case you're wondering, like, what love is, like agape love, just read 1 Corinthians 13, right? How many times have, has that been used at a, at a wedding? And a lot of Christians, this is one of those passages, you hear the thing about love, and you're like, hey, I've totally got that. The thing about 1 Corinthians 13, about the description of love, is not how many times you've got that, how, but it's how many times it's got you or been through you. What, is it, what does it say? Love is patient. Oh, yeah, I got it. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It doesn't brag. It's not arrogant. It doesn't act becoming. Uh, you know, it doesn't seek its own, etc. Yeah, I got that. No, has it got you? So what you should do when you read 1 Corinthians 13, you ask this kind of question. Love is patient. Stop. Ask a question. In fact, if you're married, ask your mate. <laughs> They'll gladly tell you. Honey, am I, am I patient? Thank you for affirming me. Thank you. Uh, am I... Am I, am I patient? Well, sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. Admit it. Is it not true? Uh, and so if your mate tells you, yeah, well, you need to improve there. Well, show, when was I not patient? And then they'll tell you. And then you take that before God and you pray this simple prayer. God, I don't love like you told me to love because I'm supposed to be patient. I'm not. So could you show me how to be patient? How long will it take him to answer that? You pray it at 105? 106, he's answered it. You know, help me to be patient, Lord. Help me to be kind. I mean, honey, am I, am I really kind toward the children? I mean, I, 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 maybe I have a blind spot. I mean, am I, am I really? Etc. What did Paul say? Don't be hypocritical in your love. That's radical. May that love be just like Christ's love. Number two, be radically righteous toward evil. Toward evil, what did he say? Well, let love be without hypocrisy and abhor what is evil. Abhor. This is a word to use all the time when you speak, isn't it? abhor. Who uses that word? That is the Greek word for hate, which is, you can see it up here. Let, let love be without hypocrisy, uh, but hate, what is evil? It's the word for hate. Now, some of you, I've already shut you down because you're thinking, oh no, I have been told that all forms of hate are terrible. I hate that word. <laughs> it's a non sequitur. You, I mean, you can't get away from it. You're going to hate something. So the person who's telling you, I hate you because you oppose this, oppose that, oppose this, oppose that, they're opposing you, therefore, by definition, they hate. So what it tells us is, some hate's acceptable. And you're thinking, I'm going online, I'm doing a Yelp, I'm doing, and he said hate's acceptable. It depends. Who's the subject? What's the object? Notice the scriptures, Psalm 45, verse 8. says, you love justice, God, and you hate wrongdoing. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellow, uh, fellow king. So, uh, David, if you hate evil, God hates evil. Uh, Psalm 97.10, what does God say outright? Hate evil. Hate evil. You who love the Lord, hate it. Uh, which means I find it detestable, abhorrent. I, I cringe from it. Uh, Psalm 8, or Proverbs 8, verse 13. What does it say? The fear of the Lord is... The hatred of evil, uh, the arrogance, the evil way, the perverse mouth do I hate. Uh, Psalm, uh, Proverbs chapter 6. There are six things the Lord kind of tolerates. No, hates them because uh, he's holy. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. What are they? Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet that are quick to run to evil, the false witness who utters lies, and the one who soars discord, discord among the, the kindred. We've just lost our entire government. <laughs> I kid you not. Because what do they need most? They need Christ in their life. And once Christ is in their life, they'll then look at what God hates, and if they hate what he hates, then they're walking with him. Because if you don't hate what God hates, you're going to accept all the things that are sinful. No. Uh, Paul says, abhor that which is evil. Be opposed to it. Now, I've told you this before. I'll tell you this again, because as I've said before, review's a wonderful thing. This is a grammatical concept. If you take a Greek preposition and you wed it to a verb, what does it do to the verb? Emphasize. It emphasizes it. So he doesn't just use the word for hate. He puts a preposition on the front of it. So it doesn't mean just hate evil. It is 
super hate it. I mean, super hate it. How do you feel about sushi? I super hate it. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Fish should be cooked. I'm just saying. I hate it. I hate it. Uh, it's things like that. But, but it's not a moral thing. But it came down to a moral thing. I would, I would need to hate that. I had uh, some Korean uh, Christian friends take uh, Liz and I to a Korean restaurant. Uh, and they were going to introduce us to Korean food because I'd never had it before. So they were trying to get me to eat the sushi. <laughs> no. It's not happening. I hate it. So the, the lady took me over to the bar. She's showing me all the sushi. Take some of this. Put it on your plate. This, that, that, that. And then get this little ginger root over here. Put this on your plate too. What's that for? She goes, would you eat that? And it kills bacteria in your stomach. That is why I hate sushi. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just saying. But I submit this illustration to you to just tell you, when it comes down to evil, it should be that kind of, I'm repulsed by that. I find that evil. What about your life shows a repulsion to evil? I mean, I know it takes a little minute for the sound to get up to the top. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, I mean, do I really think about moral issues to the point where I find them abhorrent? I mean, and I've told you this before, I'll tell you again. I mean, I walk out of movies. Why? They're abhorrent. And I will tell the manager when I, when I get him how that thing was uh, showcased in the, the, what are the trailer? Tra trailer didn't show all this. I, I would like my money back. Guess what? They give you your money back. It's abhorrent. I'm not watching that, that witchcraft or whatever it is. I didn't know that was, I'm not watching that. Abhorrent. Do you have that kind of uh, lifestyle that you turn from sin, that you won't look from sin? That's what he says. Find sin abhorrent. And then he says, lastly, radically so, if you love radically and you are, find sin is abhorrent and you're radical about that, then you're radically righteous toward God, the good that he sees. That's what it says. Cling to that which is good, right? Cling to it. Don't just kind of hold on to it. Cling to it. The, this is interesting. Uh, the Greek word here uh, for um, uh, clinging is the Greek word for glue. It's a, a Greek word for glue. He says, be glued to that which is good. Are you? Friends that are good, are you glued to them? No, I've kind of got some really seedy friends. I'm kind of glued to them. Then you got the wrong friends. You need to be glued to really godly people. It doesn't mean you can't know godless people, but be, use your brain. What about the things that you listen to in your car when your parents aren't around? Is it good? Is it evil? Well, I just like the beat and the music. I don't listen to the lyrics. Mm -hmm. I used this back in the day. <laughs> you know, I mean, what is it? Cling to that which is good. It's glue. The other day, uh, Liz brought me a pair of shoes that she loves, and they uh, separated. And the heel, and it's just, you know, favorite shoe came apart. So she came to me, and she said, honey, uh, I love these shoes. You know, could you do something with them? I'm th what is a man to do at that point? <laughs> Marriage on the line, pair of shoes. <laughs> you know, here's money, here's 80 bucks to go out and buy a pair of new shoes. No, I'm thinking, I can totally fix this. So I went out, you know, my repertoire of good stuff, found a little tiny bottle of Gorilla Glue. This, this will change your marriage right here. So I, I got it, I shot it in there, and I went out in, the, in, the, in my shop. I got some shoes, uh, some uh, um, clamps bigger than the shoe and clamped them on the shoe. Left it overnight. Came back the next morning, popped the clamp off, walked into the bedroom and said, hey, babe, here's your shoe. She's like, man, I love you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Remember this? Yeah, I know. Sorry, honey, I forgot to tell you about the shoe thing. Yeah. That's the way we should be with righteousness, shouldn't it? I'm glued to it. I'm glued to it. Are you? Are you? See, our culture is not glued to righteousness. They're glued to unrighteousness, calling it righteousness. The greatest thing you can do in a, a culture that's in decline is do three things. Let love be what? Without hypocrisy. No fake love, true love. What's the second thing? Hate evil. Hate, abhor it. And number three, cling to that which is good at all costs. Let's pray. God, we submit ourselves to you. How hard it is to do those three things consistently. And may we measure ourselves against you and not against ourselves. May our lives conform to the word of God so that we can be transformed into your likeness and so that our world can see the power of the gospel of Christ. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend.